morning, everyone. Hope everyone uh, got here safely. Uh, a little bit of snow today, so that means there can't be climate change, right? Um, this is going to be a fairly interesting, I think, uh, introduction to climate change. Most folks know about climate change that are uh, aware of it. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, in ways that will help you explain it to other people, because that's generally uh, one of the big problems we have is communication on climate change. Um, so Stephen spoke about a bit of my background. Um, so I've been an environmental journalist for 25 years, writing for a variety of publications around the world. These are the ones I write for currently. I focus on international stuff, mostly because uh, when I first started out, uh, uh, Canadian publications where I'm from weren't particularly interested in environmental issues, contrary to Canada's reputation for being green. It's not particularly green, um, sadly. Um, so I've forced me to uh, uh, develop uh, uh, an interest in the rest of the world, which has been hugely beneficial to myself and my understanding of many, many things. Um, we're going to start off way up north. So Svalbard is part of Norway. It's, um, it's an island called, also called Spitsbergen. And it's the furthest north where there's permanent year-round habitation. Uh, so it's, I forget, I think it's, forget the exact, uh, uh, 78 degrees, 79 degrees. It's way up. It's the super high Arctic snow there all year round, it's, it's real Arctic, real Arctic, you know, home of polar bears. Um, I was up there uh, at the invitation of the Norwegian government to, to be part of a special session involving business leaders, uh, political leaders from China, uh, India, um, scientists, uh, to talk informally about climate change. This is about four or five years ago. Um, and it was an off-the-record discussion, um, which is, you know, I guess the only way they could get journalists and all these folks together. And it was done up at a research station, a scientific research station um, um, called Noi Alessund, if I got the Norwegian right. Uh, unique place. And for four days, we talked about climate change, various aspects, business stuff, uh, and so on. One of the interesting things that came out of that was that the Chinese ministers were talking about climate change, not so much from a global warming perspective, but from a uh, air pollution problem. And uh, as a, uh, uh, I guess, a misuse of resource by continuing to burn fossil fuels at such a rapid rate, there wouldn't be any left for future generations. That was certainly one of the stronger concerns of the Chinese, that they thought it was incumbent upon themselves to uh, not use so much, not to waste this particular resource. Um, India at the same time was just becoming aware of climate change, so that was interesting from the business uh, perspective. They hadn't really factored it in yet. But by the end, everybody sort of was on the same uh, playbook. Um, that's what it looks like up there. Um, this was the height of the summer, so it's 24 hours of light. Uh, it's not actually warm, even though you can see a little bit. Nothing grows up there, just lichen. So they got uh, reindeer, a bunch of birds. They have a lot of birds, polar bears, and polar bears that roam around there. Uh, beautiful in its starkness. Um, it's been snow all year round, so most of the time it's all covered in snow. So that's about the least amount of snow they would have. Uh, really stunning landscape. Uh, I was not fully prepared for Arctic, so I didn't have really warm stuff. Uh, but I still went for a hike because, you know, after you're cooped up for four or five days in a, uh, you know, sort of a conference setting, I, I, at least I do, I need to get out and roam around just to, you know, helps me think and process and also to experience the place. Um, yeah, so I went for a hike. And you can see my little backpack there. Uh, there's nothing. There means nobody, nothing for miles. You know, we climb to the top of the hill and you can't see anything because there isn't. There's uh, at most 1,000 people live up there. And in the winter, it's down to 250 because it's 24 hours of darkness and super cold for like four months of the year. 
Um, one thing I didn't count on uh, was they actually get like f almost like a snow fog, although it's not warm, but it's, it, it, you lose your uh, you know, ability to see very far. Um, and uh, again, I was by myself, which is usually when I have trouble uh, getting myself into trouble by hiking to a place I sh probably shouldn't have gone uh, and getting lost. There's no rescue in this kind of part of the world, and of course my cell phone didn't work because there's no cell reception. Um, but that wasn't really the big risk. It turned out when I got back to town, they said, oh, you just broke the law. Nobody's allowed to leave town without a gun because of the polar bears. Uh, and you can't get a gun in Norway easily. <laughs> Uh, the governor of the province of uh, or Svalbard has to approve you. Uh, licensing and all that still pretty well forces you to hire a guide. Um, because they said, well, you know, last year uh, in one of those hills uh, overlooking the town, you know, two tourists were killed by a polar bear. Because uh, it turns out polar bears are, <laughs> are hungry. They're hungry because there's nothing up there. Anything that moves, they figure they can eat it. Uh, and they can, because nothing's going to stop them. They also move really fast, because they've got really long legs. Like Their legs are like this, more like a horse kind of legs. And they're 1,100, 1,200 pounds. Uh, and they've got big, wide feet like that, so they can stay on snow unless it's really fluffy. Um, and you can see how far you could see, <laughs> huge distances. Meanwhile, the snow's up to my mid-thigh, and I wasn't moving very fast at all. Uh, yeah, so that's just sort of one of the dumb things uh, we tourists do sometimes in places we don't know very well, don't understand the landscape. And this is a kind of a metaphor for many things that happens throughout the world. We do a lot of dumb things because we just don't know any better. Somebody should have taken time since the guys to figure this, to find out more about the place before I went tromping off. Um, so. We're going to get back to the Arctic and how this is uh, all keys in a little bit later. So that's the beautiful little community. Yeah, it looks nice, right? But not if a polar bear was chasing you. Luckily for me, I did not see a polar bear. Part of me said, oh, I'd love to see a polar bear in the wild. Maybe from a ship, I wouldn't mind seeing a polar bear, but uh, not on the land. So this is the view of the Earth from the moon. And I contrast these images because, there's a, as you can see from the picture, there's a big difference between the moon and the Earth. So this is my climate change explanation in only 165 words. So the moon has no atmosphere. So that's why it's super hot, 100 C, which is way more in Fahrenheit, uh, and really cold at night, like impossible to survive, never mind the fact there's no oxygen. So our atmosphere is what makes the difference between the moon and the Earth. So we know that CO2 is a heat-trapping gas. It's one of the several heat-trapping gases. It's, it's one of the large ones that um, keeps our planet a nice, comfy temperature. And we also know that burning fossil fuels, oil, gas, and coal emits CO2, so carbon dioxide. This is long, been known for a really long time. So now we have measurements that show us there's now 46% more CO2 in the atmosphere than before the era of industrialization. So that's like putting an extra warm blanket on when you're already comfy cozy. So hence the term global warming. Um, these are sort of interchangeable terms. So the Earth is now 1C hotter, which is 1.4 Fahrenheit, I guess. Um, and heat is a form of energy. And that means all this additional heat that this 46% CO2 is uh, trapping in our atmosphere means there's a lot more energy for storms, a lot more energy to affect our weather, uh, more energy for heat waves. It's a, it's a fundamental shift in uh, our entire uh, climate. 
Uh, and in that 46% is increasing about 2% per year. Uh, to me, that's a much better way of talking about climate change, the 46% more CO2, than talking about parts per million, you know, 400 parts per million, or even the one degree thing. I think it's more meaningful to most people. But keep that in mind. So for 800,000 years, we had this lovely comfy blanket that we were constant temperature, and now we've added, well, that slide's a bit old, so uh, that extra blanket on top because of our emissions of fossil fuels. So with all this additional energy in the system, it would be physically impossible for there not to be some impacts. So this is the science-y stuff, right? Uh, the measurements of the um, temperatures and the variations. Uh, obviously it changes you know, from year to year because it's not a, it's a complicated climate system. So you can look at the data over a long period of time. In this case, it's from 1860. And you can see, you know, pretty well, there's a thousand different ways to chart this stuff, but it's always going up, 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 which makes perfectly good sense when you have 46% more CO2 trapping more heat. Another version of it, that's the parts per million graph. Uh, it's up to 410 now, actually. So this year will be 410 parts per million. So again, that's just another way of measuring the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And you know, to get that 46%, you just subtract from what the uh, average was, which was 280 over uh, 800,000 year period. So we've been in a fairly stable climate regime uh, for most of humanity's existence. And now we're in moving into a different state. Uh, and we don't really know all the things that are gonna happen. Another example of where our temperatures are, so this is the uh, differences in normal temperatures versus what the temperature was for that particular year. So you can see where the hot spots were in 2015. You could uh, have another version of this for more up-to-date. The, the hot places shift around a bit, although that little blue dot, which is really cold, um, is from the melting Arctic. The ice is melting and keeping the ocean in the North Atlantic much colder than it normally would be. And that's going to have an impact. Some suspect that this is where the North Atlantic uh, overturning circulation begins to fall apart. So that takes the Gulf Stream, the heat uh, off the coast of Florida, over to Europe. So Europe, under climate change, could get a lot colder because it's that big cold blob is blocking the heat from getting there. And that big, you know, because right below the, uh, right above the big cold blob, the blue blob, is uh, Greenland. And that ice is, there's a lot of ice up there, uh, and it's melting. Uh, other places in the world you can see, like the southern U.S. and Mexico and Central Africa uh, are getting hot uh, pretty well every year, breaking records. So most of the heat that's being trapped in our atmosphere from that extra 46%, thank God for the oceans. They're, it, they're absorbing 93.4% of all the heat. So, uh, in other words, if we didn't have the oceans, we would have already been fried. Uh, so the oceans are warming up naturally. Thank God the oceans are really cold, too. Uh, so they can absorb a lot of heat. But that's going to decline as the oceans warm. They can accept less heat. And so we'll get more heat on the surface. Um, so that's, we've been lucky so far, or we will be for a little while, but that's not going to continue forever.